Everybody bring a Bible? Well, according to this guy, you don't need it. According to that guy up on the screen, you don't need it anymore. Or he doesn't need it anymore. Turn to 2 Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians 11. And um, this up here is exactly why I've been teaching what I've been teaching. It, it, it is exactly why. For some reason, people fall for this, and it just, it gets me. I'm just going, where's the Bible anymore? Who, who reads the Bible? Who believes it anymore? And uh, I'll tell you about this guy in a minute. Second Corinthians 11, we're going to go over this passage again and again and again. We're going to know it. We're going to memorize it. You're gonna, the Holy Ghost at some point is going to bring it to your mind and you're going to go, I know what that means. I get it now. Because that's the first thing I thought of. Paul said, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I've espoused you to one husband. Now, do you think that there's another potential husband that's going to try to take this husband's place. Absolutely. Always a wolf out there trying to steal the bride. All right? For I've espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That means that we have been with no other. Amen? No other. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus. Think about that, underline it, because that's what this guy represents. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Now, let me ask you some questions, all right? See if you can pass this test. Where is Jesus right now? Anybody know? Where is he? Right hand of the Father. What is he doing at the right hand of the Father? Making intercession. Boy, you guys are good. You must have a good teacher. Making intercession for the saints. Is he taking communion right now? Is Jesus participating in a Passover in heaven? He said he wouldn't until it was time for the kingdom. Yeah, fist pump. Boom, pump okay. See, all this, all your answers are coming from where? See how important this is? Now, this guy, pastor, and that's what Paul said. Pre if, any, if any man preach another Jesus. So he's a preacher. His name is Stovall Weems. He has a mega church. Mega church with multiple campuses all over the place. He's Mr. He's Mr. Hot Potato. And uh, he's the kind of guy that he'll come out with his Nike tennis shoes and his torn blue jeans and his old t-shirt and, and pretend to be the preacher. Okay? Uh, him and whoever else he has. Who in here knows a man by the name of Stephen Furtick? Stephen Furtick, F-U-R-T-I-C-K. He is another mega church 
pastor. Big, bigger than Stovall Weems. Where do you get a name like Stovall Weems from? I don't get that. But anyway, uh, Fertick is probably, he's, I don't think he's the biggest apostate, but he's like right up there on the list as far as I'm concerned. As, as far as apostate preachers go, Fertick is one of them. You can Google him and find out. Fertick was preaching at this guy's church a couple months ago. So birds of a, fl- of a feather do tend to flock together. That, sta- that saying is true. Okay? Notice that Stephen Fertick has never been invited to Bethel for our upcoming Bible conference. All right? Uh, I, won't, I won't have anybody that I don't, that, that doesn't believe the Bible or tramples on the Bible or curses while he's preaching and spouts out blasphemy. I won't have people like that. Amen? I won't encourage you to listen to him either. So that's the kind of guy he is. Well, according to, according to him, he claims, and this is a, a picture of it happening, that last um, Good Friday... The church was having a Passover Seder. Now, if you don't know what that means, the the Passover Seder is supposed to be the Passover ceremony that the Jews do. But there's a huge problem. Most Jews, when they have their Passover Seder, about, I would say, 80% of that whole ceremony does not come from the Bible. If you remember, when God gave instructions to Moses about the Passover dinner, there was very, very detailed instructions. Um, When they were eating the Passover, what was to be the position of their body? Does anybody know? Anybody know? The position of their body while they were eating the lamb. Does anybody know what position they were to be in? Standing up. Yeah, that's what you said, standing up. (laughs) Standing with their back on the ground, right? Okay. They were to be standing. Why? Because they were to be ready. Okay, they were to be ready. Um, Most of the, the way the Jews do their Passover right now, most of it is based upon Jewish tradition. And you remember what Jesus said about Jewish tradition. You've made void the law by your traditions. And they have a, 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 the Jews, when they sit down for their Passover meal, they'll have a little piece of lamb there, and they'll have a, a, a plate sitting there with an empty chair because they're waiting for Elijah to come back and sit in that chair. And their tradition is, is that there will be a knock at the door and the children will run to the door and open it up, hoping that it's Elijah coming back to visit with them to sit in that empty chair. And what they're doing is they're waiting for a familiar spirit to show up, is what they're doing. Waiting for somebody to come back from the dead to fill that chair. Now there is nothing in Scripture about Elijah showing up at everybody's Passover service. Not one thing. But that was written by their Jewish forefathers, their Jewish rabbis, their, their, their magicians, and their sorcerers. Because a lot of Judaism is pure Babylonian witchcraft and sorcery. And based upon familiar spirits and not based upon the Bible. So that's what this church was in. They, were, they had a... Messianic Jewish Hebrew roots guy leading them in a Passover Seder. During this time, the pastor, him right there, claims that while they were having that ceremony, Jesus, he, he had, he had uh, the pastor had already received the unleavened bread and he was holding it and he said right then he was caught up in a vision in heaven And he was in heaven, and he said, Jesus was there. 
the Jesus. And he said that the bread that he was holding, it was like he knew that Jesus himself had given him that piece of bread. And he sees Jesus, and Jesus is having a Passover dinner in heaven with the twelve apostles. In heaven. That was his claim. And he spent like a Sunday morning, a Wednesday night. There's like three parts to this on YouTube. I've listened to the first two. I've listened to his description. I've listened very carefully to things that he said. I've taken notes on what this man said. And I'm telling you with no uncertainty in my mind whatsoever that this pastor did in fact have an experience, but it was not Jesus. It was a familiar spirit. Now, I want you to ponder this. If you have a pastor that is hearing and taking orders from a familiar spirit, you get out of that church or you run him out. One of the two. But if he's a mega church pastor, more than likely you can't run him out. So just leave and go find you a Bible believing church that believes the King James Bible that believes that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, not eating bread. Okay, because you guys are right. That's what he said. And I'll show you the scripture in a minute. Okay. And as he, I mean, as he is telling his experience, he's saying that Jesus was speaking, but he was speaking in Hebrew. And of course, he doesn't understand Hebrew. So whatever Jesus was saying, he understood none of it. However, the, the tale that this guy tells, he tells about this experience and how it changed him and how it's made certain things like, oh, it's like awakened certain things in him and everything now that this pastor is is based upon his feelings, his emotions and the, since, since Jesus was talking but he didn't understand anything he said, then everything that he quote-unquote received from Jesus was done by emotions and experience and not by word. Right, they didn't understand him. They thought he was calling out to Elijah. Very good. I'm going to write that down in my notes. Okay, now, so, while they were having Passover Seder at, the, at his church, he had a vision and Jesus gave him the unleavened bread to eat. Now, here's the scriptures. Matthew 24, verse 5. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now, did this pastor actually hear from anybody that the person that he felt was Jesus, did the pastor hear physically that this was Jesus? The answer is no. Because whatever was being spoken, he had no knowledge of it whatsoever. He perceived and believed that it was Jesus, but at no time was it told him, this is Jesus. Okay? Then, Matthew 24, verse 23. Then, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. So, I could stop right here, and I could say, I have two witnesses, according to Scripture, this man's a liar, and I could be done with the whole thing. And say, okay, I'm going to give you all 20 minutes break for Sunday school, and then we'll have church. But I, you know I won't do that. But it's, I'm done right here. If any man says, lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. Any man would be this man. This man said that it was Christ, and I don't believe him. Because I was told by the real Jesus, who I understand, that if anybody else said, lo, here is Christ or there, believe it not. When the Catholic Church points to that, that monstrance that holds that wafer and says, that's Jesus, I don't believe that one either. When Oral Roberts said that he saw Jesus and he was 300 feet tall, I don't believe that one either. Okay? 
When, um, let's see, who was it? Not Creflo Dollar. One of these guys, one of these clown TV preachers said that Jesus came to him and Jesus was all crying and he was sad over the church because the church wasn't believing enough to release his magic powers or whatever. And this preacher had Jesus come over and weep on his shoulder and he consoled Jesus. That's a lie. If any man says, lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. You don't have to believe it. You don't have to believe it. Okay? So, Psalm, now here's what's interesting. He said that even though he could see the form, he saw the clothing and the hair, he could not see Jesus' face. Could not see it. Sterling, you remember the night you and I went over to talk to Mike Henderson. And you remember that Mike was carving on this board this figure. And he's, Mike was going, I didn't know I couldn't, I, I, I didn't know I could carve things. And I'm carving, it's got this figure. And I saw it and I went, I know what that is. And he carved this figure into this wooden block, but he said, I've got everything in my mind, all the details except the face. I can't see the face. And I told him right then and there, I said, Mike, this is the spirit that has you in bondage and you've carved out his image. And I promise you, you don't want to know his face. And I talked to Mike two hours that night and I thought I was getting nowhere. And two days later, he called me and he said, I'll be at church Sunday and I'll be down at the altar. And he was. And he, he came and testified here uh, not too long ago about that about that night when he told when when Weems said that he could not see his face scripture comes to mind Psalms 27 9 hide not thy face far from me put not thy servant away in anger thou hast been my help leave me not neither forsake me O God of my salvation when Christ hides his face from you, that's not good. Let me show you another verse. Psalm 30, verse 7. Lord, by thy favor thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. Thou didst hide thy face, and I was troubled. Psalm 34, 16. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. Psalm 44, 24, wherefore hidest thou thy face and forgettest our affliction and our oppression? When Weems said that the face of this quote-unquote Jesus was hidden from him, that's a curse. In the Bible, you read it. I got four verses here and there was a bunch more. That is, let's see if there is more. Yep. Psalm 69, 17, hide not thy face from thy servant for I am in trouble. Psalm 88, 14, Lord, why castest thou off my soul? Why hidest thou thy face from me? When you can't see the face of Jesus, you're a castaway. It's because he's judged you and he won't let you see it. Psalm 143, 7, hear me speedily, O Lord. My spirit faileth. Hide not thy face from me, lest I be like unto them that go down into the pit. See what the Bible's telling you? If this was Christ, and he was hiding his face from this guy, this guy's in trouble. This guy is in danger. So, and then he said, let's see here. Here's what he said. Turn to Revelation 1. And as I'm listening to this guy, and as soon as he said this, I knew from Scripture. I knew it from Scripture. There is a way to recognize the real Jesus. You okay back there? Am I keeping you awake? I'm sorry. There's a way to recognize the real Jesus. When you read this Bible and you know it, and you by the way, he's one of these preachers that he pulls verses from whatever Bible fits what he's going to say. 
He never sticks with one Bible. He's like with the NIV and the New King James and the New American Standard. And this, whatever, whatever he's teaching, whatever verse fits what he's saying, that's the one that he uses from whatever translation. All right. So he said I, that he couldn't see the face of Jesus, but... He was wearing a white robe and had brown hair. And as soon as he said that, I went, he's lying. But what do all the paintings of Jesus, how, how, what does he look like? White robe, brown hair. Okay. And who knows that? I mean, maybe he looked like Cubby and George and Jared. Okay. Maybe he's just as slick as an apple up there. All right. I mean, how do we know? How can we know what Jesus looks like? It's in your Bible. Revelation chapter 1, verse 12. I turn to see. Now, John, I believe. I believe John in the book of Revelation. I believe that what he said was true. And if what John said contradicts what this pastor said, who's, then who's telling the truth? Revelation 1 12 and I turned to see the voice that spake with me and being turned I saw seven golden candlesticks and in the midst of the seven candlesticks one like unto the son of man clothed with a garment down to the foot and gird about the paps with a golden girdle what color of clothes was he wearing golden his head and his hairs were white like wool as white as snow not brown he did not have hair like me. He had hair like Sterling. White as wool, white as snow. Why? I, I, and I like this. Because the sins of the world were laid on Jesus' head in the form of the crown of thorns. And he took our sins on his head. And though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as Wool, and that's what Jesus' hair is now. Why does snow like wool? Meaning the sins have been blotted out, the transgressions have been covered and forgiven, and they are no more. It's sweet! And see, if you want to see Jesus, don't follow this guy. Follow this guy. Follow the Bible. You'll see all of Jesus that you can handle. Amen? By the way, when Jesus spoke to John, what language was he using? Anybody know? Your Bible tells you. Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Greek. Not Hebrew. And this idea that Jesus is up in heaven at Passover, having Passover with his disciples. That's a lie. This guy lied to everybody. And, but his whole church, but they were like cheering him. And woo, they would get up and dance when he would say something about Jesus. And the thing that got me was, if you listen to this guy, I listened to him for two hours. And for two hours, everything that he said about Jesus and doctrine and things that he now understands, it was never transmitted to him by word. It was transmitted to him by feelings and emotions. Don't trust your feelings on anything. Don't trust them. Okay? Uh, during this event... All through his, you, if you got to watch this guy to get what I'm saying. I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to act it out. But he kept doing this. He kept every time he would say something that he was getting about this and an understanding. He was pointing here. He would take his hand and go like this. He said, "It's like I knew then that Jesus was like this," and he said, "I knew it." And at one point, he kept describing, the, he described the spirit that was in him. And he said, I keep doing this. He said, the spirit, is, he said, it's like, 
It's, it's not here and it's not here. It's here. You go watch it. Because he, he's involuntarily, he keeps going like this, pointing to his belly. During this event, all through his description, he kept using his hand placed on his belly to signify that everything imparted to him, he felt in his belly. That Jesus lives there, pointing to his belly. And that everything he gets from God is downloaded. That's what he word, that's the word he used. Imparted and downloaded into his belly. Job 15, 35, they conceive mischief and bring forth vanity, and their belly prepareth deceit. In the Bible, you know what your belly represents? It represents, that's a good, it, it is a pit. Some of you guys that's bottomless, I've seen you. It represents your appetites. Your lusts. Okay? The belly is from here all the way down to the loins. And it represents your carnal appetites. What you lust after. Okay? You study that out. See if I'm telling you the truth or not. Proverbs 18, 8, the words of a talebearer are as wounds and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. A talebearer. That's somebody that's making stories up, isn't it? Romans 16, 17, now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. Notice he used the word mark. Mark them. Because I think that that is pointing you to a time when the people who are causing divisions and offenses contrary to doctrine are going to be marked. I think this is what that, that's leading up to. Uh, contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. You, if you watch this guy, you'll see him. He's just always... And things he can't describe, you can tell he's overwhelmed with the emotions of this experience. And he just, he would start talking, and if he couldn't describe it, he would just go like this. It's in his belly. Philippians 3.19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. And whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Now, what I've been showing you from the Bible is that if there is another Jesus, I promise you, I stand on this and I'm not changing it. If there is another Jesus, there is going to be another gospel. And he then started emphasizing Taking communion. Emphasizing it. And he, he's, he's a double speaker. He says, I know we're saved by grace through faith. But, anytime they add the word but, you're in, that's it. That's it. He's going to add something to that. And he's talking like baptism now, water baptism and taking communion or Passover, and he said that he now, from this point forward, he said, what, what I felt I was getting was that from now we're going to take Passover and we're going to do it with intention, and people are going to be healed. That is a works-based reception of grace. Does the Bible say anywhere that taking the Lord's Supper gives you healing. That if you do... Perry Stone. Perry Stone teaches this. He did a... Uh, he wrote a book and did a, a couple of shows called The Meal That Heals. And he was teaching on taking communion and he said that he knows people that take communion every day and he said they're never sick. 
And he said, I believe that you take commun- if you'll take communion every day, then God will then pour out these blessings to you, like wealth and health and prosperity and stuff like that. And what he's teaching is the same stupid thing that the Roman Catholic Church teaches. You must eat this and you must drink this or you won't get any blessing from God. It's a lie. It's a setup of a reception of a new gospel. And again, the double speak is what nails it. Yes, I believe in salvation by grace through faith, but when they add that word but, you know that they're going to add something to God's grace. I mean, how many times has God blessed you and you didn't do anything to deserve it? Like every time? Um... In over two hours of him describing this event, he spake of all these new understandings of doctrine, new understandings of Jesus, new understandings of the covenant, etc. However, during this vision, he never understood a single word that this quote Jesus was saying because he was speaking in Hebrew. So he had an experience now, and this experience awakened him to these new understandings of things that are in the Bible. And his church is going to eat that up from him. They're going to, because they trust this man. And they follow the man who gives them nothing but confusion. He gives them all these different Bible translations. And then when he says he actually saw Jesus, Jesus spoke nothing but Hebrew, so he didn't understand anything he was saying. But he does have this new awakening and a new understanding of all these different doctrines now. Jim Staley said that same thing. Jim Staley, who started this Hebrew Roots movement up around St. Peter's, uh, um, can't remember, Passion for Something Ministries, now he's in prison, but he said that what changed him was that he went into a trance, he saw Jesus, couldn't see his face, When Jim Staley said he saw Jesus, he could not see Jesus' face. And I'm going, well, you know, that's that's common. Common amongst you guys. And that Jesus downloaded into him this brand new understanding of the book of Romans. The book of Romans is what establishes the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith because you can't do any works of the law. You've already blown it. So... Well, but these people over here, they do 10,000 sins, and I only do 5,000. So you're going to be nailed to hell for 5,000 sins. Okay, that's what the book of Romans said. But anyway, Staley now has this new understanding. He got this downloaded to him from a faceless apparition that he said was Jesus. Uh, Also, he said that Jesus was having Passover with his disciples in heaven. Jared, here it is. Luke 22. Turn there in your Bible. Luke 22. Verse 14, and when the hour was come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not eat any, I will, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. That's the real Jesus that said that. The fake Jesus that Weems saw was having, in heaven, was having Passover with his apostles, handing them the bread. And he said that Jesus, he, he just knew that Jesus himself had given him that bread. And he kept saying that, or he kept emphasizing that. For whatever reason, I don't, he didn't really have a reason. He just said, I just knew that Jesus gave me that bread. And all of that happened, all of that happened while he was up on the stage and nobody else saw it. So, two things. Number one, did it really happen? Who knows? Who knows? If nobody saw it, And he's the only witness at the mouth of one witness. You're not, you're not, you're not supposed to believe that. It ain't time yet. I ain't done. 
very quickly. By the way, his wife is his co-pastor. That church has, that body has two heads. Him and his wife. And you know what he called his wife? He called his wife his second Holy Spirit. He called her that. Something ain't right there. Amen? First uh, Samuel 28. Uh, I'm not going to read all of this. You study it out. This is Saul. In verse 6, When Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. So Saul now is in a place where he's asking God questions, and God is not is refusing to give him answers. Either by dreams, or by the Urim and the Thummim, or by prophets. Period. God's not going to talk to him anymore. So when he goes to find the woman at Endor who has familiar spirits, and he says, will you divine for me by the familiar spirit, Samuel? So all of a sudden, he sees this hooded figure with a mantle covering his head. Can't see his face. Right? He perceived that it was Samuel. But the Bible tells you in no uncertain terms. Look at 1 Chronicles 10, then I'm going to be done. So Saul, verse 13, so Saul died. You underline this in your Bible. So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord. That's your Bible. He committed a transgression against the Bible. Even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. It says right there that what Saul spoke to was not Samuel. It was a familiar spirit. So now, there, there's, there's a picture now in your Bible giving you understanding of what this pastor, this pastor said... I, I was immediately in heaven and I saw Jesus and he had uh, a white robe and he had brown hair and he gave me the bread and he was having pass. It's, it's like everything coming out of his mouth. You can go, no, Bible says right here that that's wrong. Okay, the Bible says over here that he's lying here. Oh, the Bible says here that he's not telling the truth. This man's transgressing against the word of the Lord. And who is the word of the Lord? It's Jesus. And this book. So, he's on my radar screen now. Because I guarantee you, the false gospel is going to come from him. And he's going to lead a lot of people astray from this book. He already had a head start on it the moment he named his wife co-pastor. Church has one bishop. One head, not two, not three, not several. It has one head, okay? And by the way, the qualification for a bishop is he is to be the husband of one wife, not the wife of one husband. Doesn't say that. So he had a, he had a good start transgressing against the word of the Lord. Now with this tale of seeing what he perceived to be was Jesus, that was a familiar spirit. And now you are going to have a familiar spirit leading this man in his congregation. And he's, he's going to be huge now. I mean, think about it. If he made all this stuff up, he did it for a stunt. Because, wow, this pastor is so special that Jesus gave him Passover bread at Passover. Oh, he's a holy man of God. We're going to follow him. We're going to give him large sums of money. But I think, it's, I think it's worse than that. I think he saw a spirit. And that spirit lied to him, and God used that to prove him. And to show those who still believe the Bible, that man's lying through his teeth. See, I, see when people start telling you stuff, all you got to do is check with the Word of God. If it don't match the Word of God, you don't walk away from it. Have no, have no part with them. Mark them. And have nothing to do with them. Heavenly Father, this Bible's right. This Bible is right, and every one of us, Lord, are wrong. 
And Lord, there is great deception being poured out everywhere. All over, Lord, the internet. All over churches. And people are falling for it. Lord, that grieves me. Father, use this church to save one person out of this church being led by a familiar spirit. Use this church and the things, Lord, that we do to lead one person to Jesus Christ, to show people the real Jesus from the Word of God. Father, I pray, Lord, your blessings on your Word this morning. Give us discernment. You said test the spirits to see whether they be of God. And Father, I'm convinced that this spirit that this man saw was not Jesus. But I'm glad that I know Jesus. And I know that he's standing at your right hand. And I know he's the reason why I even get to pray and ask you things, Father. Because he's my advocate. And he is my mediator. He is my Lord and my greatest friend. Thank you, God, for letting us know who the real Jesus is. Father, don't let us be deceived. We pray in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen.